Welcome to Guaranteed Audio, episode 27, a special video edition of Guaranteed Audio, which doesn't get confusing whatsoever because we are Guaranteed Video. We're going to talk about Animorphs today, along with some special guests. I'm Kevin James, joined by my good friend here, Ryan Murphy. And on the other couch that we got from Target, Anil Cesariga, Julie Becker, Max Pacheco. You know, kids at home... Before those Marvel movies came out, and shut were, the fuck up, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> there was a different group of superheroes <laughs> known as the Animorphs, uh, published in the book series from Scholastic, a work of creative fiction. The Animorphs are uh, something of a bonding experience that every single one of my friends appreciated and loved and read up on. And we're lucky to have uh, a few experts today on our Guaranteed Audio panel about Animorphs. Um, Max, why do you think we brought you here? Uh, because I am on an Animorphs podcast currently, uh, embodying a character who's living in the world of Animorphs on Sporadic Phantoms. It's a uh, drama, right? It's not a... Oh, is it a podcast or a drama? Or? It's an audio drama. Yes. But it's also... A comedy as well. At times. So it's a dramedy. That's what I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. Before we move on, uh, your character's named Kyle. Yes. Could you tell us a little bit about who Kyle is? No spoilers. And what Kyle's deal is? Uh, well, starting at the beginning, because it's gone through quite a lot. Um, and I think it's best to listen from the beginning. Uh, Kyle is an environmentalist. Um, he, I, I think, is a a bit pretentious. Um, he is vegan. He very much uh, spends his time uh, worrying or yelling at others about the environment and about, you know, um, not har harming animals. Uh, but he's also got two friends, uh, one of which is played by Julie, and they are investigating just odd stuff around uh, their home. And um, illegal logging practices. Yes, that's how it begins. <laughs> a central theme to Animorphs. Yes. Yeah. In book nine. But, yeah. So, Julie, Sporadic Phantoms mm -hmm. is kind of your baby, mm -hmm. right? Um, how long have you been doing Sporadic Phantoms for? Um, 2020. It started out as a COVID project because um, normally I do live theater and that wasn't happening. And I Has needed it to do really something. Been since 2020? Since wow. 2020. And. It started because, you know, in 20, January 2020, they started making the official Scholastic Animorphs audiobooks. And I started to listen. I'm like, oh, this will be fun to listen to. Then I started, then I'm like, I better just reread the entire series, which I actually never finished as a kid. And so I listened to a bunch of the audiobooks and then I read the PDFs, which are available for free, like endorsed by KA. They're all available online for free. Um, information wants to be free. Yeah. <laughs> Let's set it free. And, um, so, and then the, someone on a Facebook group was wanting to put together some kind of Animorphs podcast. And we came up with a bunch of different themes. Like, what could it be? Could it be an ax cooking show? <laughs> like that was one of the ideas. <laughs> and, and we might get to up to some ax related cooking later for our live video game stream, which yeah. is going to be put on the internet before this, which isn't confusing at all, but continue. No. Um, an ax is an alien without a mouth, by the way, just, just so you're just in case yeah. you're wondering. He appreciates food though. Yeah. So would you say this project like rekindled your interest in? Yeah. The Cause I'm like, yeah, I'm not doing anything. I'm not employed at the moment. It's COVID. And, you know, uh, I, I had all the free time in the world. Like, of course I will do, I'll, I'll be on this team for this project. We made a Trello, which is like a place where you can organize group projects. <clears throat> and um, I came up with this idea of what if it's like investigating the sharing as a cult organization and it would be like a true crime podcast. And, and um, that was the idea that we went with because people were kind of dropping out and, mm. and they're like, well, who's going to direct it? Like, Oh, I'll direct it. Who's going to write it. Uh, I tried to get some other writers who were somewhat interested, but then like eventually it was like, Oh, I'll write it. And then it was like, okay, who's going to edit it? Someone, <laughs> someone, <laughs> someone was like, oh, maybe I will. But then they kind of dropped out, you know, for understandable reasons. 
<laughs> it's a lot of work. And I'm like, <laughs> so I'm like, I'll edit it. Um, and, you know, we found some main people for it. And actually didn't have a lot of problems finding a lot of voices for it because people were interested in just doing bit parts here and there. Um, I learned about audio editing as I was making it. The first couple episodes, uh, they sound very bad. Um, but you know, you deal with that and then it gets a little bit better as I was learning the program, which in universe makes sense, you know, cause it's their first, podcast it's their first podcast. They're, they're, I mean, making, they're you know? documentarians, <laughs> but they're, they decide to do a podcast because it's COVID. Right. So right. The, the thing is the podcast takes place during COVID at the present time. So it's not in the nineties. And, um, yeah, so I made a whole season one, um, and that was nice and fun. And it was like, a, it basically released monthly, these episodes. And um, But I also made a sharing website, jointhesharing.com, that goes with it. And uh, oatmealtruth.org, uh, which is a very informative website about the dangers of instant maple and ginger oatmeal. And all these things that are um, interactive elements. You can email the characters there's a phone number to call like this and this and that it was fun and we did a whole season and um and then i'm like should we do season two i decided yeah we'll do season two and now of course like things are different but i'm still doing season two you know I'm the trick to successful podcasting yeah. is to make them like eight months apart and have willy-nilly topics that don't really dovetail into one another <laughs> and do them in your garage Sometimes do them live, sometimes do them on camera, um, and throw caution to the wind. Talk about any crap you want, Ernest. Mm -hmm. Like uh, Animorphs. Animorphs, yeah. <laughs> whoa! I just played the whoa sound effect. With you. <laughs> <laughs> now, Julie, before we get into any specifics like yeah. our collective fascination with cults, because <laughs> yes. we are all, everyone, <laughs> I mean, cults are absolutely fascinating. They really are. Tell us a bit about your character. My character is Robin. Yes. Who's sort of the leader. Well, I have the most lines. Um, <laughs> because I can record them at any time <laughs> that I want to. Um, and anyway, so my character, Robin, she's part of this team of sporadic phantoms. So they're sort of documentary collective. Um, in the first season, um, she is, uh, she's, she sort of, wants to dive deep into investigating this cult and maybe she gets a little, a little too deep. Um, yeah, again, I won't give any spoilers yeah, not, to no the spoilers. best of my ability. Uh, and also let's not forget our third sporadic fandom who can't be here in person. Let's give mm -hmm. credit where credit's due. Yeah. Abby Savoy who plays Stevie, um, who just moved to Massachusetts, but <laughs> I didn't know that. Really? Yeah. But, um, Oh, that's great. But yeah. She, she was out of town and, uh, oh. uh, we love Abby. She plays Stevie who, um, you know, she's a very practical character, I feel. And now, um, and there's a lot of banter with Robin and Stevie at this point that's, like, fun. Like, at this point, they they hate each other, so it's, just, it's fun to write. Ryan, have you done voices on the show? I have a character. I am not Doctor. No, not I don't know doctor. where that came from. I am a, an expert, Richard Dolan. And I am, uh, my character is a cult expert, allegedly. Uh, and again, I won't give any spoilers into, but uh, the Sporadic Phantoms hire my character for his expertise, for money, uh, to try to investigate the sharing, specifically one aspect of the sharing, which like so many cults do, they'll be the organization with different tiers, and then a charismatic individual or someone power hungry, think Wild Wild Country for our folks who enjoy Netflix, for money, and there's an offshoot. Cults often spur spawn out of other cults, and my character is brought on board to do some investigating. And while my character reports information to the sporadic phantoms, my motives are to be questioned. Now, is sporadic phantoms is that's anamorph spelled backwards? Um, it's a <laughs> it's an anagram. The whole I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hearing you say that. I always just assumed it was a reference to something in the book. Not at all. Okay. Just the I, letters I, in the book. Honestly, Julie, I didn't know it was. I didn't know it was an anagram. I thought it was like old school uh, Slenderman YouTube channels of like Marble Hornets. Right. That has yeah. nothing to do it with. Sounds Slenderman. like it could be. But right. I, so you know what it is an anagram of? I do not. We'll take a look at the letters. I will. 
Yeah, um, it's over there. Uh, all right, PH and James Cameron. <laughs> anamorphs. I mean, is yeah, it just animals? Anamorphs, but also, what are the remaining letters? Oh, I don't know. Well, okay, it's Poop? it's it's a uh, anamorphs podcast. Oh, <laughs> oh. I never cool. noticed. Yeah, that's good. Fun for the fans. Thank so, you, Julie. For mm-hmm. those at home who've listened to Guaranteed Audio, you might be expecting us to go into our media current segment where we talk about art we've recently experienced. Uh, I've experienced a lot of anamorphs in the last week as a bit of a boot camp for this. Before we move back into anamorphs, is there anything anyone recently experienced they want to talk about? Uh, like, I feel like some people might want to hear us talk about something just to keep the semblance of the oh, format. Uh, I watched uh, The Jinx Part 2. Did any of you watch that? No, not yet. Was it fun? Oh. Yeah, it's good. Okay. It's, yeah, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> she dies. Oh, well, that, well, didn't, that. He, didn't he? I'm thinking of the stairwell. It's the stairwell where the guy dated the editor of the documentary series. Oh, I don't it, know. And that wasn't put into the documentary. Uh, I found yeah. that out later. Uh, I know the director of The Jinx Part 1 and Part 2. His family, I think, was also apparently rich New Yorkers and kind of grew up alongside the Dursts. So there's some Uh, element of uh, maybe old beef or something like that. Um, I don't know. Huh. How about you, Max? You watch anything good? I sure did. (laughs) I saw The Vordalac. And Ooh, the Vordalac. Uh huh. Is that a? That's like a morph for Visitor Three. <laughs> <laughs> the Vordalac is a recent release. Um, I saw it at the Brattle Theater, which has featured short films that we've all been in or worked mm-hmm. behind the scenes on. And uh, it is a French horror film in the vein of The Witch. Uh, cool. Basically, has two locations. One location is at the very beginning, and then we leave and go to the second location. Basically, uh, it's a period horror piece. Uh, This French uh, diplomat is knocking on the door of an inn and he's saying, help me, help me. The roaming bandits, you know, destroyed my wagon and killed my envoy. And they're like, well, we can't let you in because you might be one of those roaming bandits that kills envoys. And so they're like, go down the street to the farm. They might have a horse that you can ride back, you know, to civilization. So this guy shows up at the farm and he's like hey everybody got a horse and they're all like and he's like oh no i'm in act two of their horror film Uh. um and uh it's it's just great it's a lot like the witch um Hmm. there's some great puppetry in it it will be available on streaming on google apple and other platforms uh next month august so Hmm. go check it out thank you max you're welcome (laughs) uh how about you julie any Anything? Well, let's see. As far as things I've watched, nothing like particularly um, niche, <laughs> right? I like I like the boys. Like I like that show. I've been watching that. Have they killed Homelander yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> How many more years will he be alive? <laughs> <laughs> um, I did finish a really interesting audio book. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, about what? Bunny by Mona Awad. It's like a kind of fever dream. Um, I don't want to spoil Jesus <laughs> spitting ever. Um, I don't want to spoil too much, but it does. It involves bunnies and it's kind of like the craft. Oh, but it's kind of like a, like a craft heathers, um, the craft, type of vi- yes, the yeah. uh, yeah. type of vibe. Um, and it's like this group of click of girls who call each other bunny. Um, and, uh, it gets weird. It gets really, really strange. Um, so I, yeah, I recommend it. It was an interesting read. Cool. Yeah. Ryan, what about you? Uh, I've been doing a lot of homework lately, <laughs> and I put on a movie which I thought would work as background noise, and which often fails. And it was uh, as a for you know for a fan of Orson Welles, I'd never seen his and Joseph Cotton's other production. I know they worked together on Citizen Kane and other things, but. Uh, I think Cotton's in The Magnificent Ambersons, but I've never seen that one either. I put on The Third Man, Mm -hmm. a film I only knew from references in an episode of Pinky and the Brain. (laughs) And and the theme song is famous. With the zither. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, like so many awesome movies, the soundtrack is kind of a character. And it's real. I think it's actually the soundtrack that made me think of, oh, this is a slower movie, black and white from a different time, slower paced, muffled audio. 
that I could just, you know, put on the back. But no, it really gripped me. <laughs> I ended up not completing my work because I got, I got it's it's a murder mystery and it it gets you. Yeah. Uh, it's really interesting to see. I remember watching a video essay about it before I watched it of seeing the transition from old school actors, performers who had been gone from stage to early Hollywood, early film production. And the more realistic, like actually emoting of a guy like Orson Welles, of that weird juxtaposition of, because the film has a lot of older actors and a lot of performers in, uh, in Europe who were just used to a very different kind of performance than Americans were doing in Hollywood and outside of Hollywood. And it was really cool to see a movie that acknowledged like the 50s, we think about American 50s, but the 50s in Europe were about reconstruction and the Marshall Plan after World War II. We just don't talk about that or show it a lot. It's a really interesting time in the world hmm. to me. <laughs> what do you got, Kevin? Um, I mentioned this earlier off, Mike, but uh, I went to see Long Legs, uh, the, the the weekend it hit cinemas, and I did not care for it. So I went home and I immediately looked into my list of movies I have that are on my back burner, like movies I need to catch up on, um, and I needed a guaranteed good movie. So I watched The Birdcage for the first time. Has everyone here seen The Birdcage? No. Nope. Oh, oh you're going to have fun. It's a remake of a French film, which was actually based on a play. It's called La Birdcage. Right? <laughs> La Birdcage. <laughs> La Birdcage. Uh, the Birdcage stars Robin Williams and Nathan Lane is a as a uh, gay couple. They run a... In Miami, uh, right? Uh, yeah, they run a drag club in Miami. And their son comes home to let them from college to let them know, hey, I'm engaged. Um, but it turns out uh, my bride to be's parents are super conservatives. The father is a senator, played by Gene Hackman, and it is funny as hell. It is so not what I thought a mid '90s uh, gay themed comedy film would be. There's no gay panic to it. There's a lot of uh, uh, there's really good drama in it. There's some really good drama between Nathan Lane and Robin Williams. Uh, Hank Azaria is in there. Um, nobody told me Gene Hackman was in the movie. <laughs> I went my whole life not knowing. So when he showed up, I was stupefied. And uh, he's, he's a really good ingredient. When's the last time you saw it? Uh, you know, honestly, maybe before COVID. But um, but I know it. I mean, it's, it's really fun. What, do you, what about you, Max? I, I watched it for the first time like two, three years ago. Okay, so it's, so it's pretty fresh for you. Like, yeah. Were you like pleasantly surprised too? I was, yeah. It was one of those movies where I was like, is this underrated, overrated? Has it aged well? What am I going into? Is it going to get bad? Like, when's it going to happen? Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I thought it was delightful. Gene Hackman's great in it. I'll say, I'll say, I'll describe one joke in it, and that is um, Nathan Lane. Uh, in all the trailers and all the ads, Nathan Lane decides to go um, undercover as a woman to convince the conservative uh, family that they're a hetero couple. And not Mrs. Doubtfire. Yeah, yeah. Right? And this was like, yeah, the, uh, Robin Williams was offered the role and said, no, 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 I want to play the other member of the couple because I don't want to do drag. I just did drag. Um, and the scene where Nathan Lane meets uh, Gene Hackman is so informed by Nathan Lane's character who loves being on stage, loves feeding off the vibes of an audience. So anytime uh, Gene Hackman's character says something like just venomously conservative about, say, how abortion doctors should be killed, uh, Nathan Lane will then yes and that <laughs> to keep the dinner conversation going well, to keep up the ruse. And I believe Nathan Lane says something like, oh, no, I don't think it should be the doctors. They're just following orders. The mothers, though, they should be killed. That's like, you know, the, the captain should go down with the ship. And then Gene Hackman over dinner looks Nathan Lane in the eyes. You can practically see the hearts in his eyes. And he says, that's just what Rush Limbaugh said. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's quality. It's a really good comedy movie. Um, and yeah, like I, I know it, it might I feel like it's. Uh, it goes without saying, but it's the kind of movie that reminds you what you had with Robin Williams. I definitely took Robin Williams for granted in my 20s. And every time I go back and watch a new Robin Williams movie, uh, new to me, I'm uh, pleasantly surprised. Like, no, he, he had a really good batting average. Robin Williams had some good damn movies. Nathan Lane, too. He's underrated, I think. I, I, I miss seeing him in stuff. Yeah, I watched Mouse Hunt a couple months ago. Yes. It was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Nathan Lane, uh, also in Miami Vice, um, had a weird movie career, like kind of didn't take off in the movies, even after uh, The Lion King. Like, uh, yeah, I don't think it was until The Birdcage that Nathan Lane was like front and center. Yeah. Like, and then put, he did The Producers, and I don't know what he's been doing since then. Well, you know, I I'm glad you brought up The Producers because uh, 
producers with him and Matthew Broderick really, really suffers from a stage play adapted to a movie in a way that they didn't. They should have just filmed the stage play. The cast know, is stuff. really good in that movie. The cast is fantastic. He yeah. cast holds it with Will Ferrell, Uma Thurman. Uma everyone. Thurman's so good in that. Uh, and yet, the Birdcage, you can tell certain. You can tell it's come. It came from a stage play, but that's how you do that right. That movie is photographed so perfectly. The Birdcage, mm-hmm. like it's it's shot by someone older director. Uh, they wanted the stage sensibilities. Like let they they I think they did it weeks of improv with like cheaper cameras to figure out how Nathan Lane and Robin Williams were going to play every scene because they didn't want to be too loud, yeah. um, for better for lack of a better term. So they 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 improv improvised everything to tape and then looked back through the tape picked their favorite interactions and replicated them on film as you saw some of the photography in that movie is very wes anderson lensing miami vice like there's Mm -hmm. a lot of like pastels and just like long takes of the water and so forth um no great movie i really like that movie um we're gonna talk a lot about animorphs in this episode so i thought a good shot in the arm would be to start with a quiz about animorphs (laughs) we're gonna start with a quiz uh because everyone here is even Healed in their understanding and knowledge base of Animorphs. And I, th- yeah, I'm going to hit the transition button. <laughs> All right. This quiz for Guaranteed Audio episode 27 is called The Animorphs Quiz. I'm going to go through everybody here and ask a question. We're uh, each going to get one, two, three, uh, three questions, I guess. And then we're going to do a knockout round. So we're going to start with Julie. Julie, mm-hmm. are you ready? Yeah. Julie, for one point, what is Visor 3's birth name? Um, uh, Esplin. Correct. Esplin what? Don't do this to me. <laughs> it's a four-digit number. I wanna, oh, Esplin I wa- 9466. I, want, I, I was going to say 9466. It's I 9466. Bet she was. Okay. I bet she was. Max, in 1997, Scholastic ran a contest called What Would You Morph? And their first prize winner was a 90s kid who wrote about turning into a panther. Their prize was being turned into a character in Animorphs that was named after them. Who was this character? Kid won a contest, got turned into a character in the books. What was the name of this character? David? Not David. Oh. It was Eric. Oh. Uh. Eric King. Okay. This is a hard one, Ryan. Okay. Ryan, Tobias has a tortured family life, but his uncle is actually pretty cool. What is the full name of Tobias's uncle? Aximili Eskaroth Ismil. Damn, you didn't miss a single syllable. <laughs> <laughs> All right, no Neil. study. All right. Neil, your first question. Oh How many letters are in the word yerk? <laughs> Five. Correct. <laughs> yes. There's no shame in counting with your fingers. That's what they're there for. <laughs> um, Max, back to you. Oh boy. Cassie has had her DNA acquired twice in the series. Neil, uh, I, I know you're, you're very well versed in Animorphs, but as a refresher, mm-hmm. uh, to turn into a creature in Animorphs, once you've used the Escafil device, you have to touch the creature to absorb their DNA. But Cassie, one of the Animorphs, had her DNA acquired twice in the series. Max, can you name the two things that acquired her DNA? Well, it'd be Axe. Correct. Because he used it to make his amalgamation. Yeah, everyone knows a that. human. Yeah, yeah. Frollo's maneuver. Um, <laughs> I can't think of the other one. I'll give you a hint. <clears throat> it's a bit of a body horror moment later in the series. Body horror. Julie, do you know? Um, I would. Mm. Uh, um, so Cassie was acquired three times. <laughs> okay. <laughs> is there, is there well, a time would... matrix involved in one of these three? An Elemist, no. perhaps. No. Oh, wait, wait. No, hold on. I no. I'm sorry. Redacted two times. I was confused. Keep c- continue. Who's the, okay? But well, I know what it. I know the answer tell, though. Tell, tell, tell it, tell Max. An ant. An ant. An ant that crawled on the Escafil device. Ah. Uh. And um, and like, crawled on Cassie, and then morphed Cassie. So it was Cassie with an ant's mind. And it just like tried to kill her. What book was that? Uh, the Buffalo Book. Uh, book two. Right. <laughs> Marco, the coolest animal, turned into this as his first morph. I think. All right. 
I want to say Marco's first morph was probably or something. They I don't remember, but because it it definitely wasn't a zoo animal. They had to build up to the zoo. It was a zoo animal. It was a zoo animal. I listened to the book on tape uh, yesterday in this I, very room. I believe Jake first does his dog. Um, but so, all right, if Marco were to pick an animal, he would have gone bold. I'm gonna say a bear. No, it was a silverback gorilla. Ooh, awesome. Ah, uh, <laughs> uh, yep. See, Neil's good at the context clues. So, Neil, here's your second well, but question. But I, I was right about Marco and Bold. It was true. That wasn't the question. Neil, your <laughs> second question. How many eyes do Andalites have? Ooh, <laughs> I almost said two, but it's four, isn't it? It's four. Good Yay! job. Wait, the word or the... Or the <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, back to Julie. Okay. Uh, Julie, how do yurks reproduce? How many yurks are involved? Um, there is a tri-parent bond um that's that's what i Correct. and then the, and then they die after they reproduce yeah i'll give it to you uh right so all yurks have no parents that's why they basically well they have three parents they have three parents but but they die they're the, right. they're, oh yes yeah isn't yeah. that in, in a diminishing form. returns though no they, they have like, like a lot of, of a lot of little yurks oh they have a. Uh, they have a brood. They, they, yeah, they're yeah. a hideous brood of slug things. It's not like the three takes three to make one. They make no. They make a litter. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Max Cassie was once trying to buy a new CD for her music collection <gasps> when she realized that her mother would never let her own a Nine Inch Nails album. So she told a little fib. That's a lie. To her mother about what the N I N on the album stood for. What did Cassie lie about? What did Lassie, What did Cassie say N-I-N stood for? She said, nice is neat. Correct. Good work. Good work. I knew that one. <laughs> I, yeah. so I, I had to make some, uh, some in-universe nice is neat tracks for, for yeah. erotic phantoms. <laughs> yeah. Got another deep cut question for Ryan here. Ryan, in the Andalite Chronicles, the best book, Alfangor enjoys this earth drink while taking a drive in a Mustang. What was he drinking? Um, all right. He is listening to the Rolling Stones, mm -hmm. Can't Get No Satisfaction, and it is a Mustang, red, I believe, convertible, uh, which he drives awkwardly because he has four hooves. Because he's a freak. <laughs> he's a freak. His <laughs> first drink, I'm going to guess, is a Coca-Cola. It's so close. It was a Dr. Pepper. Uh, Somehow that was burned into my mm -hmm. brain, so I thought that wasn't too hard, but that is a hard one. Wait, wait, wait. Is he in human form by that point? No, no he's drinking through his hooves. Oh, of course. Okay. Yeah. I like that we're not explaining any of these in layman's <laughs> terms. Like, you know, the yark, he drinks to his hooves. Like Come on, everyone. This, get this, with it. This uh, is the bucket of cold water. That's why I just called an audible and said, let's do the quiz now. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> this is why you know to stop one. <laughs> Neil, uh -huh. can you name three alien species from Animorphs? No. You have 30 <laughs> seconds and the other players... Can help you. Okay, so right pantomiming. off the bat, all right, all right, all right. I go. I know uh, the Andalites. That's one. I know the Yurks. Okay, that's all I know, though. Okay, well, well, hang. Let's think about it. Show, oh, oh, is that, that little guy? Is that uh? Well, you know, you, there's well, two things that are you know a sure thing in life: death and taxes. Close. Close. Yeah. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. Hey. 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 Oh. Julie, that was a great hint. Good hint. I don't know why I knew tax on to say tax on. That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I got, okay. Oh, the timer ended. You got to just. <laughs> All right. We're going to do a knockout round now. I want an illustrator to do something about death and tax on. <laughs> we're going to go round robin and. We're all going to name as many bullshit and delight vocabulary words as we can until we can't name anymore. Does mm -hmm. everyone understand? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. you know. Like the ones that are in the books. Something that would be in the glossary, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to start with Ryan. Ryan, give me some Andalite sci fi mumbo jumbo. Just one word Zero's kindness. Zero's kindness. Okay. Um, I'll go with the morphing cube, the Escafil device. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go with Nothlet. That's a person who's stuck morph, stuck in their morph because mm -hmm. they fucked up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yerk. <laughs> <laughs> The no, the Andalites cool. did not name them. No, 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 no. Andalite bullshit vocabulary. Are we sure the Andalites didn't name the Yurks? No, the Yurks were sentient because they were True, but did they have a name before? They, they had uh, a name. Gets. <laughs> Dirt monkeys. I don't know. Dirty little gets. <laughs> All right, deal's out. Elfangor. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> Max, you got one? 
blade ship. Oh, <laughs> that's a yerk term. That's a yerk no. term. Uh, it's a yerk term. But are these andalite? Yeah. Uh, are, is this andalite language for yerk? Andalite things? bullshit vocabulary yeah. was the name of the game. Yeah, but and, do the yerks refer to themselves? Yeah, they call themselves yerks. Yeah. yeah. Did we yeah. already say okay. Escafil? Yeah. That yeah. Was, uh, I called Escafil. <clears throat> <clears throat> um, how about okay? How, how, what's like your um? What's like the uh, the message you give when you die and pass on? What's like the thing you like your last oh. testament, like your journal entry from beyond the grave? For anyone? I'm trying uh, to give Max a layup. I, okay. I'm not as right, so we're down top to of this as you think. Oh no, let's give Max. If if Visor Three is in a blade ship, and lights fly in a has a beautiful park in it. I know I I like drew one of them when I was little, but I don't. When I tell you you're gonna be you're gonna dome ship, oh space yeah. ship, <laughs> space <laughs> ship. <laughs> I I can't keep doing this because I already looked at the list of my phone. So it's down mm -hmm. to Ryan and Julie. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, can you name another one? Well, we said. Uh, What's an Andalite's last word and thought? I don't remember that. Two one. words. Uh, but I, I was gonna, I was gonna say Dracon Beam, but that's because Yerk steal term. that from. Maybe I should have Well, then what's okay? When they stole the technology, what was the Andalite term for that same weapon? For a Dracon Beam. Yeah. A gun. Space laser. <laughs> I, I mean, I'm not wrong. That's not what they called. <laughs> um, oh man. I still. Julie, just tell us. A shredder. Ah. Uh, they called it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, was gonna that, say I, slicer. Bet. I still think Yerk might be, I mean, that could be a, because it's kind of like how like the Nazis didn't call themselves the Nazis. No, Yerk. Their detractors I, did. So I, maybe. I just listened to the entire book, Visor, yeah. which covers the span of time between Yerks like getting to Earth and so forth. Again, they call themselves They're the proudly Yerk. Yerk. Okay, we yeah. are Yerk. Yeah, yeah. All right, tell me what that being said before. When the Yerks first, what is a, they steal an Andalite ship. Are they still in Geds? Because the first plant they get to is Hork Bajir. Oh, that's, that's the first they really. Because now we're going to start piecing the puzzle together. What do you mean, stealing geds? <laughs> well, they, they steal all the geds. <laughs> but when they, whenever Yerks steal their first ship and go, holy shit, what are we doing now? Don't use, don't use loaded he, terms like he, steal. Geds, <laughs> geds are native to the Yerk home planet. Right. Right. But they suck. They do suck. <laughs> Yerk you love. So. Well, what host do they use to steal the first ship? They, have to, they must use I Geds. I it was Geds. Okay. Yeah. Well, is that it? No, no, keep, yeah. I want to hear the rest of the list. Oh, no, there's there's like hundreds. I'm not. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> Can you uh, pick a top three? Uh, What's the name of the tail blade? A shorm? Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> what's the part of the tail that you, the, the, the good part? The good, oh, the, the good <laughs> part. I mean... Yeah, we a actually blade? Have a, we actually have one. Yeah, yeah there's one over there. <laughs> a shorm means Andalite best friend. It means that you would put your tail blade against the other's throat or, and they wouldn't be afraid. Oh. Uh, yeah. That's what shorm. Well, we've covered everything you need to know about anamorphs. Yeah. Um, when Andalites <laughs> get old, their hooves get soft. Hooves. <laughs> <laughs> Is it okay to like poke their hooves? Well, the axe brings up the fact that our dad, his hooves are getting soft, and it's kind of like male pattern balding. Like he doesn't like to talk about it. Yeah. His hooves <laughs> are getting soft. Yeah, it's like a thing that they're like. It happens to guys when they get older, but they don't want to. You know, I want to talk about. It. <laughs> How do you find out by accident that your father's hooves are getting soft? <laughs> like you could see male pattern baldness. Oh, uh, maybe like oh, he's got to wear glasses now. Like you something? can no, you can like maybe you can hear a difference like when they're clip clopping around. You know, yeah. like oh, that, that that's softened. <laughs> it's like <laughs> old soft hooves. Hey, Dad, want to get some crabgrass? Like oh, your father, his hooves are getting too soft. <laughs> I, I think it's safe to say we're going to move into an open discussion about all things anamorphs now. Yes. So I'm going to hit the other transition button. It'll be real great. It probably played the whole song. Animorphs. Animorphs. We'll talk so, about animorphs. So the cat's out of the bag. Neil, you don't know a fucking thing. I don't about know shit about animorphs. <laughs> I read the. All right, I read the first book in fourth grade because yeah. a girl I liked was into it, and uh, that was it. I don't really remember much from it. That's like all. that's my exact experience with reading the first Harry Potter book. Oh yeah. Like I remember. Oh, really? I remember talking to Neil about reading the first Harry Potter book, and I told him I didn't like it, and you kind of like called my bluff. Like you you thought I didn't read it. Mm -hmm. Like I remember this. You're like, yeah. What didn't you like about it? Like that was the mm -hmm. exact exchange, and I said, I don't know. I 
I, I remember him talking to a snake and that being a recurring <laughs> theme and thinking that was kind of uncool. And you said something snappy and be like, that happens on like the first 10 pages. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, um, uh, being that I don't know shit about Animorphs, I uh, decided to... Uh, I, I felt like I wouldn't be able to contribute enough to this conversation. You've made so it this far. I wrote a poem about Animorphs <laughs> that I would like to recite to all of you, and I think it's one of the best things I've ever done, and I'm very proud of it. <clears throat> <laughs> Shut up, Kevin. <laughs> Just what is an Animorph? That is the question I put forth. Is Billy Joel an Animorph when playing on his piano morph? Is Tim Allen an Animorph? I know I've seen him Santa Morph. Is James Cameron an Animorph? Deep in the Mariana Morph. <laughs> Filming Zoe Saldana Morph <laughs> with a widescreen lenses, Animorph. <laughs> Is the Incredible Hulk an Animorph? Portrayed by Eric Banamorph. <laughs> when hit by rays of Gamma Morph, he morphed. Just like an Animorph. <laughs> I've seen Americana Morph in cities like Atlanta Morph and states like Indiana Morph, mm -hmm. Louisiana Morph, Montana Morph, and Sweet Home Alabama Morph <laughs> with songs like Oh Susanna Morph. Alabama Morphs. You often hear down south, not north. <laughs> Do chimpanzees banana morph? Does Jack Black Kung Fu Panda Morph? <laughs> Did Kurt Cobain Nirvana morph? And does Carlos Santana morph? And did Princess Diana morph? I'll never know the answer, for I never read the Animorphs. You're going to hell. <laughs> You're going to hell. So while we were out here building the set and prepping the show, mm -hmm. were you like just sitting there with like a crayon? Like, <laughs> yeah, in my non-dominant hand. <laughs> so... I feel like we should have said this off the top. This is going to be us geeking out about Animorphs as if we haven't already. Um, Animorphs is one of those things that, uh, yeah, it was a huge, it's one of the few things that was a significant part of my childhood as a kid of the 90s that hasn't really had a um, proper resurgence. It's never quite been uh, brought back. The fandom sort of kept the flame alive. There have been stories you know, in the Hollywood trades over the years about, hey, maybe it's going to be a new show or a movie. But more or less, it is one of the few things from our shared past that is uh, our memories are purely mining from 1997, 98. Mm -hmm. And for the uninitiated at home, uh, what the hell was Animorphs, the trumpet player? That was what I named the uh, segment. Animorphs, <laughs> the trumpet player. Uh, Animorphs was a very popular book series from Scholastic written by a husband and wife duo that went under K.A. Applegate, uh, purely her name, uh, for the mainline books for the first 30 or so, right? Mm-hmm. And then, then they had Ghost Riders, right? Yeah, but then they came back to do, like, the last book and, and all the Chronicles. And it's, 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 I mean, Goosebumps was clearly the most popular book series of the 90s. Harry Potter, does Harry Potter count as a 90s book? Or They're scholastic, it? and they are the yeah, tail end. Yeah. Yeah. Tail end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just of the 90s. Uh Animorphs is explicitly a science fiction book series. Um, I was talking to our friend Dan Hamilton about this recently. It's probably, it has this wall when you want to explain to people why Animorphs is cool. And it's a hard wall to get over. And it's just, the the book covers, as cool as they look, they scream Lisa Frank meets like early graphic design software. It, it's the, the book covers are uh, absolutely the most well-known part of... And they're cool as hell. They are cool. They're yeah, people cool. who People who saw the book covers never bought or read the books. Yeah. And we can't. it cannot be overstated how much the physical media of the books were sold by scholastic book fairs that came to schools. Yeah. It's the book fairs that made this a thing. I totally bought the first Animorphs book um, at a scholastic book fair in a display that was a huge cardboard standee with that like low polygon lizard looking right at me from the first book but um it is kind of it, it's a war story from the perspective of child soldiers fighting in an invasion of the body snatcher scenario if you need the elevator pitch yes they can turn into animals that's the wall i was getting at like you have to get over that because some people hear that and go uh-huh like they just no matter some people no matter what you say they don't think that's cool um, and you're talking about a generation of folks, kids, when we were kids, 
mostly white kids, but I'm sure that many ethnicities read Animorphs. In spite of it being a multi-ethnic group, uh, at the end of the day, scholastic book fairs went to middle and upper class schools. That's just reality. Unfo- unfortunately, those are the folks that they were advertising these young adult books to. Uh, but we're talking about people who before Animorphs and Morphing and Power Rangers, uh, they had zoo books. They had they were they were they were talking about kids who were really into animals. We that can't is, copyright the animal kingdom. <laughs> we gotta figure out a way to license them. But they try if they could animals, they would animals. Hey at zoo books. <laughs> Ever see that video? Yeah. Oh guy. yeah. <laughs> it's a parody of zoo books. But um th- I th- is that a fair enough elevator pitch, Julie? Like th- mm-hmm. these kids, they're they're fighting against an alien invasion. They have to do it covertly, and they're given the ability to turn into animals by a benevolent alien. And they have to fight guerrilla warfare style. Mm-hmm. And if uh, I, before, Julie, gorilla. I'm not going to steal your thunder gorilla. here because I want your, but I want a, a side by heart here, 60 seconds in and out. An alien ship crash lands on Earth. A powerful alien with an interesting past gives an object of great importance. And in their dying breaths, entrusts this responsibility to Hal Jordan, the Green yep. Lantern. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it's Greenland. And you know what? If you're going to steal, Green steal Lantern, from the best. Captain Marvel, Animorphs, it's mm. all the same. It's, it's, there's nothing new under the... The Babadook is just the boogeyman. Is your boogeyman story good or bad? Um, I would say... It's I, good. I, I, it's so hard to like harness this conversation because I know we've all talked in group texts over the last couple of weeks about doing this show. And there's so many little anecdotes and stories we want to talk about. I, I find it very easy to emotionally gush about Animorphs in a way that I, I mean, I, I, when I like something, I like something. I could talk to a wall on these podcasts. I talked about Ernest for about 15 hours somehow. Uh, but with Animorphs, there's something so exclusively 90s about the time and place, uh, the context of the story. This, this is just before the advent of cell phones. Dial-up internet did exist. Um, I've heard Julie from a number of people, like when I listen to critiques or read interviews with the, the authors or even, um, is it Mattingly, Dave Mattingly, the guy who did mm-hmm. most of the book covers? Mm-hmm. Um, they, oh, I've heard so much of that sentiment of this has to take place in the mid to late 90s. Why do you think that is beyond just our mm-hmm. association with that being our, uh, uh, our, 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 our turn into adulthood mm-hmm. being when we read these books? I mean, it's logistics. It's if uh, it's it's due to surveillance, and it's due to cell phones mostly. Um, you know, if uh, if they had cell phone and, and like cell phone cameras, um, that's a good point. You know, and they they could basically, in you know, the the idea is that the animorphs would be tracked down very early on and just killed, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, and 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 the whole story couldn't happen. You know. Um, that, that's something, Neil, you only read the first book. The, these are graphic stories. And I, I, it's one of those things that you hear this. I, I feel like you hear this about so much children's writing and entertainment when people want to go up to bat for it. Like, oh, uh, scary stories to tell in the dark. Those pictures are fucked up. Kids shouldn't be allowed to see. That's always the first thing you hear is this was beyond the years of the intended audience. Like when you, when you yeah. hear about PG-13 movies from Amblin and stuff. Animorphs truly... Um, was some of the first body horror I ever experienced. Not just the act of morphing, but um, j- just the idea of a yerk, um, the brain control slug thing. Um, I found that to be the most, I, as a kid, I found that to be the most captivating part of it. The, um, I don't know if you call it empathy, like turn tangible, but the, the, the forced uh, perspective understanding. Like every, any of those books that involved a yerk kind of piqued my attention. Right, like just the, the 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 being John Malkovich of it all, hmm. um, but but you think beyond like the cell phone cameras, what, what else is, what makes it a '90s property? What makes it a '90s property it has a lot of '90s references. Sure, like basic, uh, very simple. Like, do you think Alanis Morissette could be a Yurk? Oh, let's go to the <laughs> let's go to the music festival and see Offspring and Nine Inch Nails and Alanis Morissette and you know, it, like. Etc. And you know, uh, there's the one book where um, Ar- Arnold Schwarzenegger helps uh, save the animal or save uh, the guy the animals are trying to save. And like, we felt a strong arm help us pull the guy out of the water, and we looked up, and it was Arnold. Like, very mature storytelling. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not since like, Wild and Crazy you know, Kids. There's that, we... that, and then there's also they recruit more like child soldiers, and like a lot, and they're all they all die. Like, 
I don't know. Uh, I've got to save the animals. <laughs> yeah, it's like, not funny. So it's <laughs> that they 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 t- constantly talk about the TV shows they watch. Like, oh, I, oh, like can't this wait? Can't this mission wait? I have to go watch Buffy. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, it feels, the whole thing feels like a Buffy sideline. Like, uh. I could see there being like an arc on Buffy where there are brain slugs. And, Absolutely. You know, oh yeah. yeah. Um, and, you know, Julie and Neil, if I may, uh, what we always want to give credit where credit is due, and we always love to cite our sources. My cell phone is turned off to avoid any electromagnetic interference with my mic, <laughs> but I want, I wish I could cite him by name, the video essayist who did so much work on Animorphs and put out that wonderful piece of ground that many of us have tread already. Animorphs in the Age of Trump. Is it Paparina? The guy who does the um, Nick Snack. The, the... the Nick Snack? Is it the yes. same guy who does yes, those? Yes, he does. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I don't does... think I've seen his Animorphs one. He's done, very good. He, he's done all of them. Like he, That was like his earliest content. Oh, right. Yeah, he's done. Oh, okay. Yeah, and yeah. He, acknowledges he does have a series on. The, like all history, the good, the yeah. bad, and the ugly. His piece on Animorphs in the 21st century uh, is wonderful. And if we're treading some of the same ground, I'd love to cite you by name, but I don't remember your name, and I've watched your video several times. Paparina. The, Pop, thank you. Pop Arena is the Pop name Arena. Of the uh, he brought up a really valid point that I think Julie is tiptoeing around, which is the perceived prosperity of the 90s. Mm. Yeah. The Cold War was over, it was before 9 11. We didn't have a clearly defined enemy. Where we mean Americans, the West, all of the West. Uh, yeah, pre cell phone, pre our current understanding of the internet, obviously the modern, you know, does it 90s. take place in the suburbs? Yes. Got and it. Again, Nailed it. We're talking about th- <laughs> <laughs> unlike any other book series aimed at children. That's well, I, I get the sense that uh, the, the, to speak of the '90s, there's like a certain like free reign that these kids have. That, sure. That doesn't necessarily uh, latchkey exist kids anymore. Yeah, they're latchkey. Yes. Kids. There's actually um, one of the animorphs whose name Tobias. Uh, he is the definitive latchkey kid. That's sort of I would say his defining characteristic in the first book or so. Um, and it enables some of his hardships later on, where he gets stuck as a non nothlet, mm-hmm. as a nothlet, as a uh, as a red tailed hawk. Because he's yeah, I, I remember this because he stays in the hawk form for longer than two hours. Yep, there's a time limit. Your 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 superpower has has parameters. Was Otherwise, that um, they're all just gods? <laughs> Was that just a careless oversight of his? No, it was an emergency okay. because of their first time in the Yerk pool. But, now that's body horror, but yeah. we'll save that. But did he actually do it intentionally? Uh, I, that that's I, kind I, of I, having just listened to the first book on tape by, yeah. yesterday. I, I see what you're. I think it's implied. Think, it's fifty fifty there. Yeah, hmm. for sure. Um, it's a good series. Like jo- like all joking aside, like all like grandstanding and like screaming, like no, this was a good thing for my childhood. I, having kind of done a crash course in the last week, listening to a few of the books on tape, watching some of the TV show, uh, reading a bunch of interviews, listening to interviews. Uh, there was like a like a Entertainment Weekly interview in 2016 with Kay Applegate where I just got to revisit like some of the landmark moments of the series. I think it's a damn good book series, like no reservations. Are they still in print? I know there was a reprint that they tried to make it 21st century that were with new covers that was awful. I, yeah, I, I don't think they're mm-hmm. I don't think they're still in print. And the originals are actually kind of coveted on eBay now. Hence what you mm-hmm. said that, you know, the Applegate couple is um the husband wife uh, mm-hmm. writers are okay with the PDFs being open source yes. because they're only sold in the secondary market now. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, these origin these aren't printed anymore. One they're- thing I want to note about the the book book covers is uh aside from the famous morphing effects these were also the kind of books that had a little hole cut out in on the cover and you know it would you'd see through the hole and uh there would be an inner painting uh that kind of completes the picture a, a digital painting a digital painting those whatever, were yeah. mostly by david mattingly i believe I think yeah was, and yeah i feel like that's almost like too much work like they didn't have to go that far do you know there's a flip book in every and book? there's a flip book the gimmick the the gimmick value of these books the corner mm-hmm. has a little flip book animation you'd be has a dumbass not to buy one of those books <laughs> I, I I'm, I'm just not, saying it's yeah. it's very um they go above and beyond and it uh, I can see the like specifically the whole cutouts in these would probably lead to them getting ripped and torn a lot yeah uh, which or probably misaligned. or misaligned or just many like, a I can child see didn't eat up. lunch so that they could get an animorphs that day at school I actually want I have a I have so many 
childhood Animorphs anecdotes that I need to stop myself from getting into because no one wants to hear them. But I distinctly remember a time I mowed, I did a bunch of yard work for a friend of my family. And to pay me for my hard work, they gave me like a $25 check because it was like, it was like a full day of work, right? I was like maybe 11 years old, 10 years old. And being they a gave dumb- gave you a check? Yeah, and being a dumb 10-year-old, I was at the Kingston Mall later that day with my mother or brother, and I walked into Walden Books, and a new Animorph book had come out, and I attempted to pay for the book with the check, and the person behind the <laughs> counter had to explain, like, you can't do that, because I was in, like, third grade, and I was so frustrated, uh, uh, I ended up, like, bugging my brother or my mother, whoever was with me, to uh, buy the book for me, but I distinctly remember feeling robbed in that moment. Like, I busted my <laughs> ass. Just give me this $5 book. Uh, if only there was a bank at the mall. <laughs> so I, I'd, I'd be curious to hear your experiences about getting the books, because I feel like that was so much of Animorphs right. back then. I mean, we've talked about the Scholastic Book Fair. Was it was it on a monthly basis? Yes. Like goosebumps? Yeah. Yeah. And like, so they, they came out pretty often. Um, the book fair was, you know, to me, like these books were like a glowing beacon at the book fair. It's like, ah, screw this garbage. Well, maybe I need this Goosebumps book, but, you know, Mm -hmm. forget the rest of this. Like, oh my God, I can get an Animorphs book instead of, you know, a real book. Like to me, when I was a kid, I felt like I was cheating. Yeah. You know, it's like, haha, I'm reading, but actually I'm having this fun sci-fi adventure. I, 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 I don't, so Julie, Ryan, Max, we all read these circuit. We read them when they were coming out. Yeah. I could get through one of these books in seriously like 50 minutes. Like I got to a point, I, I outgrew them. Like my, my, yeah. I, I physically, my brain got to a and point. There's the thing, Kevin, you out, they stayed at about a sixth grade reading level, yeah. which we started around third to fourth grade by sixth grade. We were done, meaning when these books got to like the 50 second, 50, how long do they go for? 54. 54. And does that yes. include the, the spinoffs, like no, the Chronicle? No, it include the spinoffs. So meaning roughly 60 by that, books. Like 60. Meaning yeah. by the time they were done, you mo- people who started the series simply did not finish. Yeah. I did not finish. I only I bought up to book 37, which a lot of people that, I'm, that I have seen online, they buy up to book 37 or 36. and they. Well, That's fascinating as the reading level didn't go up over time, like Harry Potter, as their audience aged, recognizing you got them at a certain point and your audience is getting older. I think that's why I like the Andalite Chronicles so much because it was like a big book. It was like 300 pages. It was the biggest oh. book I'd ever read. And you know, time. back at a time when public libraries were relevant to kids and adults' <laughs> lives, I don't ever recall seeing Animorphs at a public library because oh. uh, quite frankly, if there's like one through fifty four in town for per town. I can't imagine a kid like catching up on something that came out by nineteen ninety nine. They're not going to be reading a book from five years ago. And they're al- not. Also, book thirty seven is kind of widely regarded as one of the worst books. If is not it the really? Worst book. Is it the starfish one? No, that's thirty two. That's okay. when I stopped reading. But thirty <laughs> seven is is like, yeah. A lot of the Goosebumps collections on eBay stop around like Chicken Chicken or whatever. Like and what's interesting cover about that gets... is Goosebumps was never good to begin with. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but even that, like, yeah. Um, it's widely known that like that book was. It's a Rachel book. It's written. It's ghost written. Obviously, it's uh very like highly out of character. She's just kind of um full fully full-blown nuts she says i am the king of the world and she goes on a rampage like but like is that the one where she like grows claws or is that no that's 40 later. Or something? that's like uh 48 or something sure um and uh no it's it's they they go and like vandalize a lot of local business establishments they, like they go into borders bookstore and they <laughs> Um, Take a dump rip, on the rip up all, all the cash <laughs> registers, and yeah. it's because just because a, a controller works there, and and uh, it, it, I don't need to get in the whole plot, but it was like a very uh, awful like. <laughs> It, did it was Scholast- very out of character. Did Scholastic have it? So they ripped up a Borders. Yeah. Did Scholastic have a deal with Barnes and Noble? Was this like? Was <laughs> is the subtext of the text? There might be some. Could be going. you, or it could be all in books. <laughs> I remember. Oh, Walden. I remember being very sad that like I didn't want to read Animorphs. I anymore. had that moment too. I I like had to tell my mom because you know she would just like keep buying me the new books. I was like, 
mom, I think I need to stop reading Animorphs. What do you think? And then she was like, yeah, it's what happens. It's a oh, kid's thank God. You, <laughs> you grow out of it. Oh, no. no, no, no. My mom was, was very good about, like, she would take me to the bookstore and she'd be like, you can get anything you're actually going to read. Like, don't come out of here with can, 40 books. But can we? I, I love this story. I don't know if it's come up on the show before. D do you remember what happened the time your mom sat down to watch Power Rangers with you? Because you told me this story and I've oh, repeated it. Yeah. <laughs> this is such a good, like, the hardships of being a parent. <laughs> so, and, uh, um, Power Rangers had just started, like, you know, first generation. In America. But yeah, yeah in America. Like, Day of the Dumpster, yeah. yeah. And um, I'm watching it and basically because it was a new thing and all my friends were watching it. And my mom was like, why do you like this show? And I'm like, oh, yeah, because they're, you know, it's all dinosaur themed and they all like turn into like these dinosaur things. And then she goes, the show has nothing to do with dinosaurs. <laughs> and then I never watched it again. I was like, you're right. I, everyone, everyone has that moment early in life where like the, your parent has to tell you, like, well, you know, the Ninja Turtles aren't real. Right, yeah, that's my favorite one of those <laughs> because your mother was looking out for you. But with, but, but with Animorphs, I, I remember my mother uh picking up one of them and reading through it pretty quick because they were like usually like 150 pages, I think, on average. Um, and I think she thought, like, oh, this is pretty harmless, but um, I, I think uh, those books you know, you, you hear this sentiment a lot about fiction that stays with people the older they get, it never talked down. For the most no. part, like there was a little bit of, hey, kids, uh, when it came to things like referencing comic books or video games, like, oh, uh, this girl thinks she's Wolverine. Like that, was, that felt a bit researched and labored, but that was few and far between. Most of the show, the show, most of those books, at least the ones I read, because I, I read about 70 percent of them, I want to say, felt like uh, vehicles to explain where wars come from and what it's like mm -hmm. to truly be in the middle of it, because... From the first book, these um, these five kids who are tasked with uh, saving the world, with saving the with, with defending Earth, with the morphing powers, they're they don't they're not all in like at all. Like there's a lot of drama regarding like, well, if one of the characters, if Marco, who is one of the five kids, uh, insists that he that they shouldn't get involved because my mother has passed away, it's just me and my dad. If something happens to me, what does that mean for my father? And throughout the series, Marco's father is like like a very realistically illustrated depressed single parent uh who like watches. struggles to get employed yeah he had a good job and now he's struggling with like minimum wage to like just to pay the bills like it's pretty adult things at a sixth grade reading level that there's yeah. definitely kids growing up in the 90s who had a parent like very that. 16 like, candles very yeah like, yes <laughs> but but like the, the, the mental energy to a lot of the books we'll get into the weeds of the mental energy required to do a good job of at the guerrilla warfare thing and examining uh, yeah. with an honest lens what it's like to have a killer instinct to do these things is killing necessary is is breaking a few eggs for the omelet worth it here um not just killing yurks but like you know the, by virtue of the people who are being controlled by the aliens by the yurks would Rachel have ever made these decisions if she wasn't flung into this? Yeah. Among uh, among uh, every character has their moral ups and downs. But So uh, are they kind of like espionage stories? Are they sort of quite like... Quite a few. Quite a yeah, few. Yeah, yeah. yeah, oftentimes. I mean, they, they have to keep it on the down low. They have to hide the fact that they are humans. They're basically masquerading as aliens throughout most of the series. Mm -hmm. So it's like an infiltration and like finding out who is compromised and stuff like that. Figuring out the weakness of the enemy. Yeah. They, I... I, I the, I really felt like I was at just the right age for this series out of the gate because I want to say it's book seven where the Animorphs get the drop on this thing called a Kendrona. It's 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 something that basically the Yerks feed off of. It's It emulates their son, and without a certain length of time, they, they can't go that far without it or they die. It's like an anti-Kryptonite kind of thing, right? Mm. It's like they need it's to like be It's like Superman around. needs our yeah. son. Again, nothing new under, nothing new yeah, yeah. under the Kendrona. And uh, they... they it's it's treated it is kind of like a comic book in that the serialized nature of the books like there are a lot of references back and forward in time like oh well we had taken out the Kendrona a few months ago like three books ago uh so it has all the benefits of like comic book style storytelling without a lot of the drawbacks like you're not there's not there's no ads in these books it's just like all killer no filler mm -hmm. um genuinely good plotting you could tell um that the writing couple they 
they, they weren't just like flippantly throwing out a blob. There's there, I mean, there's plenty of sci-fi gobbledygook and lots of new aliens that keep getting invented as it goes along. But the moment to moment espionage, the sabotaging mm-hmm. of the Kandrona stuck out to me as such a, yeah, they did it. They, they finally, they really, you felt the dent they put in the Yurk invasion in that book for books, subsequent books for like mm-hmm. six months. Because like there's a whole thing. Uh, like George, R- oh, like George R. R. Martin, with his dragons are coming. The dragons are getting bigger. The dragons are a threat. The dragon, the dragon, the dragon. Marsha, Marsha, okay, Marsha. <laughs> the whole thing is, we are not going to win this. Sw- They're an army of Yerks. They have Hork Bajir. They have Taxons. They have Visor, Visor Three. They have, an, and they're invading humans, infesting humans by the thousands. We've just got to wait till the Andalites come. <laughs> We've just got to wait till the Andalite fleet shows up and saves the day. It's such a funny sentiment in hindsight, because when you first read those books, yeah, that's like early on in the books, that's the plan. Like we just, like, I think they hold even specifically say, we just got to wait a year, right? It's like yeah. basically yeah. a year. We got to hold out a year. Yep. And Axe tells them as the idealistic, you know, younger brother of the of the slain Elfangor, like, of course the fleet will do the right thing. Of course they'll come see how cool humans However. are just like I did. <laughs> However. <laughs> However. However. The Andalite forces are spread too thin. <laughs> <laughs> that's a recurring line in the TV show that, um, yep, th- these are... But you know, these are in jokes Ryan and I've had for literally thirty years. So, <laughs> pardon me. <laughs> but we know what happens um, with when the Andalites actually do come. They say, "Oh, uh, we're gonna quarantine Earth and just like let the Yurks take over Earth and like just so we can get rid of the Yurk problem." Yeah, yeah, yeah. the Yurk so problem. Yeah, we're collateral damage. Yeah. The, the Yurks, the Yurks love humans because you can actually. We're, we're one of the first certain levels of intelligence they've dealt with where we can be coerced into voluntarily doing it. Mm-hmm. Whereas like previous right other species, it's just like an involuntary, like physical slave labor thing as far. Um, well with the, with the taxons, they agreed to be infested because for food for, yeah. T- Cause they got a lot of good food out of the deal. So. The taxons are a nightmare. Oh, a the taxons need <laughs> to be a, their planet. Their home world is a nightmare. They're terrible hosts. They're strong. They're too strong. Like the whole taxon plan, when Elfangor and friends, Elfangor and friends, <laughs> end up on the, the, their attempts to like, we have to, we all have to morph as taxons. We have to blend in as horrible centipede, mon- giant centipede monsters <laughs> that all they do is eat each other. Um, that the, the whole Yurks attempt to even like build, a, I don't know, a radio tower is just insane. And not like the, our entire, our one and only priority is get off this planet forever. So does the series wrap up? Does the story it, there's does. absolutely yes. an ending? Yeah. yeah, you don't have to spoil it, but that is interesting. That is, uh, I, it's it's lucky that the like it didn't like lose enough popularity and that it got well, canceled before it. Well, by the final book, there's sort of a but maybe there'll be a new chapter. It, it mm. feels like something the publisher wanted more than the writers. I, I don't. But in the end, like uh, at the end of the day, nobody gets out. Cl- no, everyone's hands are dirty. Everyone who makes it to the end. At the end, it's, I mean, it's kind of heavily Im- implied that they all die except for Cassie. No, well, right? then I... Get, they meet me. another dumb alien that they, they're like, maybe there'll be another t- show. Like, no, we're not. This, not this is so silly to bring up, but as, as opposed to everything else. Uh, wasn't there a piece of writing that K.E. Applegate put out a few years ago, maybe two years ago, three years ago, that was like a Rolling Stone interview, a fake one, obviously, between like... Jake or Cassie and Rolling Stone. Um, that was kind of like a where are they now? I feel like that was talked about, but I don't know if it ever was released. Mm. I huh. didn't read it. It was definitely talked about, oh, we're gonna release this uh Rolling Stone interview with Cassie. I, um I wanna say I I, we, it's so funny, we basically have an hour to go we, we have an hour time limit now. Not <laughs> unlike half an anamorph. Uh <gasps> yeah. you, I think I, we should probably wrap up within the next half hour. So we'll, we we'll have try, time we'll try. Yeah, yeah. This is this is it's painstaking because I could do this for this is like mm-hmm. a four hour thing we could totally do. Like I <laughs> yeah, I genuinely love animorphs. Well, don't worry, we're gonna keep talking about it's, animorphs. So, yeah. You can understand there's so few things in pop culture that I love that haven't been completely botched. Like like mm-hmm. like everything like I Jurassic like, Park, I, like, like Ghostbusters. I, I've I've had watched so much stuff get sullied, but animorphs really did just click for yeah. me. All has not been board. rebooted. Has not been adapted. Mm-mm. We haven't talked about the chi, uh, but I, the I mean again, we could do this for a while. <laughs> <laughs> let's spend like let's spend a solid more than two less than five minutes about what a worthless piece of shit visor three is <laughs> to have gone this far without discussing visor three i thought it was visor three until uh. i was in fourth grade with ryan 
and I convinced our teacher for like reading hour to read an Animorphs book. Miss Dempsey. Uh, yeah, Delaney. Delaney. <laughs> See, Delaney. But she, she was super nice. She's like, yeah, these are huge with kids. I should probably read this first one. And so I was already like 10 books in or whatever at the time. You know, I, I think uh, you're going to have your... Yeah, I, I'm not going to cut you off. I'm literally cutting you off and I apologize. I do more than anybody. But I don't think that she didn't want us to... Because like Julie, we had teachers in elementary school who didn't want us to read these books. And I wonder if it's less of a content and more about the fact that we made this adult woman like, I have to read another book. She so <laughs> she agreed to read... Basically, she agreed to read the first book to us like one like it was like with us it was like it was like it was like a reading circle thing she'd read for like half an hour she got through the book in like a like five or six sessions definitely less than a week and i distinctly remember the first time she read the word visor out loud and she said visor and not visor like my kid brain was like no no no, visor visor sounds lame it's it's visor visor's (laughs) cool that's not how you would pronounce it it is visor Vizier. uh yeah vizier (laughs) it went in Uh, france (laughs) i i i want to bring up something Going back to the whole like first blush, like your everyone's first impression of animorphs. When you hear, oh, there's this popular science fiction book series about kids who turn into animals to deal with aliens, you might think, oh, this was a, a backdoor way to teach uh, zoology, like to get people, and that is part of the flavor mm-hmm. of the book. Yeah. But yeah. I, I've listened to and read interviews with K. A. and um, what's her husband, Michael Grant? Grant. Mike Grant, where they've said no, like that was like the last thing on our minds. Uh, we hate it, animals. <laughs> it, that, that's kind of the thing. Is like you think, oh, there'd be like these beautiful depictions of like of nature and such, and there are, but there's also like cannibalistic alien centipedes that are like eating each other's stomachs and intestines, and the nightmarish consequences of like. What if you can do an ant? Yeah, it just mm-hmm. it burns into you. I distinctly or uh, uh, Tobias, the uh, the the fellow who gets stuck as a hawk, a red-tailed hawk. He there's an entire book. Early on, where the, the the animorph gang thinks, oh, we can we can we can do this. We can hide him in our attics. We can keep him around. It, it's not weird at all. <laughs> and there's this this there's a distinct moment in that book where Tobias he's literally just hanging in the attics, hanging in closets for days and days, waiting for people to come home from school to give him like lasagna and stuff, and his stomach can't quite handle it. So he just has to go out and like eat mice. And like the book really paints you into a corner. You have to read the moment Tobias hunts down and eats an animal uh, to survive. And this is like book three, you know, like they, these books really were designed to teach perspective because each book, it goes round Robin. Like book one is Jake, book two is Rachel, three is Tobias, four is Cassie, five is Marco. Six is, well, it's not from Axe's, pers- six is when we meet Axe, I believe. Yeah. We meet so I think we're back to four, but. In four? Okay. Yeah. But he gets his own marquee book in eight. eight. Okay. And it keeps it keeps rotating. But like they really are perspective. Like e- even the Yerks are given I wouldn't say like a long leash, but you understand why these deaf, dumb, blind creatures, the second they're given physical sentience beyond just swimming around in a pool, they can now experience like levels of sensory input they couldn't before. And it like and the Andalites go through this too. Like and you know, t- tying that's the in common theme there, of all the writing it, I'd say. Uh Talking like how these things, like Marco with the situation with a single unemployed dad, yeah. Tobias is like a teenage runaway. Um, Jake, who is comes from a wealthy middle class white family, he's the cop. He's the whitest <laughs> of them all. I mean, he's he's the Leonardo. He knows his brother's a controller. It's a th- it's a th- barely thinly veiled allegory for my brother has a drug addiction problem. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then when Jake has to be tied to a chair in a cabin in the woods and detox, Yerk detox, it's rough. Mm. Yeah. And you get like visions of supernatural monsters that can transcend time and space. They have to b- like. What just, are we foreshadowing? One what? of the it's book six, mm-hmm. um, the capture. Yeah, uh, there's a, uh, one of the animorphs. Neil gets accidentally taken over by a yerk, and the rest the rest of the gang figures it out and they strap him. He to He never a chair. eats Fruit Loops. <laughs> it's not that. It's they, not. <laughs> they strap him to a chair in the middle of the woods and they, they shoot him. They, they shoot him in the head. <laughs> no, they, they have to take turns uh, watching him starve out. I, I got to stop myself. I could just go through every one of these books, but that book, I reread that book like three times mm-hmm. that month. I loved that story. They're basically World War II stories, right? Like There is <laughs> Megamorphs um, 3. <laughs> they go through time they go to world war ii tobias kills hitler <laughs> wow finally Ooh. accidentally whoops but 
I vaguely recall so- seeing someone describe this on Twitter or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. Uh, like that, that happens. Oh, so and they meet Arnold Schwarzenegger. They meet Hitler. Any <laughs> other uh, famous? Um, fam- There's dinosaurs. Famous famous cameos. There are actual dinosaurs. Hansen, like, ooh, ooh, hang on, Han- Hanson or <laughs> 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 like Kevin Ryan. Shut up. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's in. Um, it's in one of the books. I, I think it's a Marco book where they have to go to the the Marriott Hotel for Ooh. some kind of gala and um Hansen's there and um there there's like uh cockroaches everywhere and like Hansen freaks out I I forget because they see the cockroaches in their salads that they're served and there's like Hansen screaming and running everywhere Do um, you have the book with you? I'm sure it's in here. So let me see. Uh <laughs> We have so much ground to cover. Like, really? I, I'm, Wait, I'm the one. Are we doing is Visor three at the Marriott? Is Visor three at the Marriott? He's always. Well, let's let's do it later. So we, got, I, so we have we have twice. we have so many we have we have questions from patrons. We have the Alternomorphs thing we want to read through. Oh my god! I would say this much. Do um, I have one more anecdote? I absolutely want to get out there. Does anyone else have an Animorph story, like memory, something they want to talk about? Just the the biggest thing for me was it was the the internet was barely a thing. Yeah. You know, I wasn't like in message boards and whatever and looking up fan art. Um, I had f- a few friends that read it that I would like, oh, did you read this one? Oh, what did you think of this? You know, and all of this stuff. And you had the art inside the cover and eventually you had the TV show that none of us like. But it was <laughs> really kind of like <laughs> it was like it was the first time that I really built this whole like world and that I had like this special interest and this special community. And so much of it was in my mind. And, you know, I would sit and I would draw like fan art based on the descriptions and try to figure out like the colors and all of that. And I think part of that goes back to what we were saying before about this existing in the nineties, because now you would have access to like fan art and that would sort of color the way that you think of this and there would be more discussions and theories you know and that would also tie into it and very quickly there would be some sort of adaptation you know uh as well of something this popular you know they wouldn't wait probably as long as they did with like the nickelodeon show apparently scholastic talked to ka and mike and uh they were like hey we want to make a show what do you think and they said it should be animated should go to Warner Brothers Animation specifically. Mm-hmm. And they said, well, we want it to be a live action. So no. Like they basically wanted like to do a CW show. I was just thinking like this would probably make a good anime more than any other mm-hmm. like Western. I If you can cap, I mean, it's such a slippery slope to talk about. Because this is, I, I'm sure, Julie, you've listened to so much Animorph stuff, like doing your research for your show. And I know you and I talked like a month or two ago about like, this is what everyone always talks about. Like, oh, I love Animorphs. Why mm-hmm. don't they make a show? Why don't they mm-hmm, make a movie? Mm-hmm. But it's such a natural conclusion to draw from because it doesn't, you ha- you kind of have to know the series to, to say this, but I feel like most fans are, are, are proponents of like, just steer into the body horror, let it be PG-13, let it be kind of uncomfortable and really play up the, 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 the parasitic, invasion war stuff sense of paranoia yeah like don't make it funny you know yeah i mean it is it's both it is funny and silly and ridiculous yeah and there's like deus ex machinas in so many in like literally a character that is a deus ex machina that can change anything sometimes our friend god shows up (laughs) wait what the the, the entire and he interrupts the (laughs) elemis interrupts a live production of the lion king because of course he does true and um he, he's essentially God, and he created the whole situation of the animal. I do not like the Elemist. Yeah. No, I've yeah, never been an Elemist He's an, an asshole. Guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, like the, the conceit, the writing conceit. It, it feels like okay. a bridge too far into um, Star Trek touchstones, because there's yeah. a bit of Star Trek Absolutely. cast across the whole thing. Uh, when, I, when I finally watched a couple, year, uh, a, year, a couple of years into college, uh, my friend sat me down to show me Wrath of Khan, which is a... Perfect movie. I love Wrath of Khan. I got to watch it right now. But I got like 20 minutes in and I just tilted my head. And went, <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. It's like when you watch an episode of The Simpsons 100 times, then you grow up and you realize like, oh, this is where the third man comes from. Yep. This is where God Isn't um, Night of the Creeps a big uh, ear slug movie? There's a lot of ear slug things. Yeah. But, but Star Trek's kind of the 
Wrath of Khan specifically is. Yeah. 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 I think it's important to have like the super serious grim stuff and the super ridiculous stuff like magic school bus style. Let's go into Marco's body. Yeah. You know, and um, but the thing that like when I was a kid, the thing that like sucked me in was literally the first page is like, this is real. This is not fiction. This is happening right now. And it could <laughs> be like in your neighborhood. I'm like, yeah. <gasps> yeah. you know. Yes, like immerse. How can they sell this? Like, <laughs> is, this, is this real? Like, I, call I so I, I pretended that forward it was real. by Alex Jones. And, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> Sorry. Uh, continue. Um, yeah, I was gonna say like the sense of paranoia and that no one can know and that we can't trust any of the grown-ups. Uh, yes. You know, it's it's like us kids who know the truth and um, we, you know, we we have to take everything in, into our own hands. It's all, <laughs> it's all in, in your hands. hands. It's all in our hands. And um, to me, it felt like these are secretly my best friends. Sure, sure. And I, they live in my town. I lived mm-hmm. in I lived in California at the time. Like they could be my neighbors. Like I lived near Palm Springs. I literally saw Arnold Schwarzenegger when I was like seven at an amusement park, like on the bumper boats. With, you know, like you saved an animal. It's a very animorph situation. <laughs> it was what I'm saying. <laughs> so like I felt like I and I wanted to have it be so real. I really, really wanted to believe in it. Um, no wonder you guys are so fucked up now. Yeah. <laughs> and and so I guess oh, yeah. <laughs> my point is like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just joking. Yeah, ah, he they painted his walls with animorphs when he was growing up. He's a little, you know. <laughs> no, but I, I do get the sense of like modern fandoms have are like just like a wash in that the sensibility of like people obsessing over like um, universes that are a little more fleshed out than most media allows yeah, for. That we were talking about this earlier. That that movie, um, I saw the TV glow. Highly recommend it. Um, it speaks to exactly that. Mm-hmm. Um, fantastic movie. TV glow. I saw the TV glow. I saw the TV. Okay, that's You'd the title. Love it. You'd, uh, I I I got to get through these three quick beats. Okay. Um, Ryan and I are. We've been friends since we were elementary. I mean, third grade, second yep. grade. Uh, my uh, my relationship with Ryan is almost exclusively built on Animorphs in those early days. Um, our first conversation ever was probably about Animorphs. We were among the I th- we were probably the only two. We were probably the only got two. it. Um, in Animorphs, the Yerk Pool in the town of our protagonists is underneath the junior high, uh, underneath the kids' school. And Ryan and I used to be in this thing called the Extended Learning Program. It was kind of like this like elevated like learning course thing you had to do ancillary to Mm -hmm. school and um it was basically beneath the elementary school it was the basement of the basement and every time ryan and i were like taken out of class to go to elp we had to walk down these like two staircases into the sub basement of the school and like the first few times we did it we'd be looking at each other like fucking your pool (laughs) Uh, um, i remember i I did i did the elp too i I remember it being low <laughs> yeah instead of being elevated like you're the gifted kids you're reading at too high a le- you're, re- yeah, you, you're reading at sixth grade level and higher in fourth grade go to the windowless room with the woman who's like never Put gonna in your shoe and beat it <laughs> yeah we 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 loved animorphs uh one of the first times we hung out one-on-one as kids like just like ryan's parents dropping them off at my my mother and father's we um we tried making our own Animorph book covers, but without computers. Just, dr- yeah. We, like, printed out photos of us, like, and photos of a cat. And, like, I was like, don't worry, Ryan, I'll figure this out. <laughs> I was, like, eight years old. And, and today, we know, like, it's really hard. It's really hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Uh, and uh, years later, and this is a story I don't know if we've talked about in this show. I just I have to get it out there for this podcast. I'm rushing through it, but it's so goddamn good. It was St. Patrick's Day, 2009 or 10. And who should be in town but everyone's favorite author of Animorphs, R.L. Stein. Stein. R.L. Stein, the creator of Goosebumps. Not Animorphs. In Boston. Um, a, a, a book signing of some sort. Neil, yep. Neil, Neil, do you want to... Get a like... new project, not Goosebumps. Yep, he... Neil, do you want to tell the story? Uh, uh, we, I mean, we, we waited in line. To meet we R.L. Stein. What bookstore was it? Was it a... It was in Harvard Square. The Harvard Square But it wasn't bookstore. the Coop. No, it was the one that was up the street. Yeah. Yep. Um, we waited in line for a we, while. For a while, we Mr. All, Stein was there. We brought books that we wanted him to sign, and 
he was nice. We we finally got there. And uh, I said, I have something I'd like you to I had him sign the Werewolf of Fever Swamp, mm-hmm. one of my favorite Goosebumps books. And I said, I have something else for you to sign, but it, would you be okay with that? And he said, I've signed potato chips. I've signed napkins. Anything you'd like. And so I brought out Animorphs book number one. And Mr. Oh, Stein camera a little bit. immediately slapped it out of my hand and said, get this shit out of here. <laughs> he really did. You implored him. You said, he, my friend Kevin would, he would, he would want a one of a kind. Yes. <laughs> I wasn't there. And I, I have, I have to attack. I cannot perhaps in the future from those listening to this story, watching this story, there will be another copy of an Animorphs book signed by Mr. R.L. Stein. But to the best of my knowledge, as of today, July 19th, 2024, this is the only copy of Animorphs signed <laughs> by R. By R. L. Stein. Stein. And he did, uh, yeah, he said, uh, get that shit out of here. And then he uh, warmed up immediately and said, ah, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, he. and then while signing, he even let us uh, us collectively know he'd recently met the uh, the couple, that pen name K. Applegate, and said, you'd think I would have met them in the 90s, but I never did. I met them in, uh, I think, 2012, and they were the nicest people. I, I got to oh. put that book like on ice or something. That's like... <laughs> Don't drop it or sneeze on it. <laughs> Pick your nose. And, <laughs> and Neil, as you'd pitched, the uh, the hole through Jake's lizard face has, in fact, cut. Oh, yeah. Is it right open. there? Right. That's right. why you got to take care of your books. <laughs> All right. I got my anecdotes out of the way. We're on borrowed time. I- I'm willing to skip uh, Alternomorphs because I'd love to get our patrons deserve it. Our patrons give us money. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's do some patron questions. Yeah. Why don't we? Why we, we do couldn't th- do this without you. Let's do questions from patrons, and then if we feel any gas in the engine after the video game stuff later, this is all out of order. You're not going to know any of what I'm talking about. It's going to be complete Greek to you. Maybe we should do the Alternomorphs after that. Maybe. I thought. I thought starting with the podcast and going to the video games would like. I thought we were going to like peter out real early. I'm more jazzed to talk about animals. <laughs> yeah. It was two hours. Yeah. Now it's time to be the animal. <laughs> yes. Let's uh let's take some questions from patrons after the break. It'll be real great. Every episode of Guaranteed Audio, we take questions from patrons over at guaranteedvideo.com. That's right. We still own the URL. We haven't fucked up yet <laughs> so uh we take questions from folks uh, you could put a dollar in or two dollars in whatever you want how much do you think it would cost to get that url back if we ever lost it from like some like ukrainian like yeah. domain hoarding guy <laughs> i don't know too much well too mr much. musk wants it he's gonna <laughs> so uh yeah we only ever charge in our patreon whenever we like make a movie or a lot of content and we usually just buy better equipment like this new mixer we bought uh which yeah. has limiters and compressors and more sound effect buttons whoa <laughs> uh, Goodney KP <laughs> asks, "What is the your favorite Animorph book cover?" Um, I always liked. I believe it was twenty six, Julie. That's one where they go and they fight the Howlers. Yeah, just because I got to see everyone in Battle Morph when I opened it up. Um, how about you, Julie? My favorite cover. Oh man. Um, let's see. I. I don't think about such superficial things. Well, I'll, no, I'll, I'll say that I was immediately drawn to book two, The Visitor, where it has Rachel turning into a cat. Like that was, I was drawn to it because I was also like a blonde girl and like that looked cool. So that was actually the first book that I read. I didn't, I then I read the first, uh, then I read The Invasion, the first book in the series. So I actually started. Really? Yeah, yeah I started, started with book two. two. I like the hand-drawn illustration of her mm-hmm. turning into a cat. I yeah. like that. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I would say that one. How about uh, you, Max? I don't remember which book it was, but the the one where I think it's Rachel turned into a bear? Mm-hmm. Seven. Seven. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and... That's um, a good That's a, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and, and I believe that had the, the inside jacket illustration of them, like, in an elevator? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I really like that one. Did you guys get creeped out when you saw the first official picture of a yerk on one of these book covers? Yes. I was Not out. what I imagined. Yeah. Uh, Not what I imagined either. I was it the cat? The, the sickness. Was it the Cassie one? Ooh, like, the ca- <laughs> yeah, it was called the sickness. Number 29, I want to say. Man. Um, Brianna Johnson asks, uh, can you write an impromptu song about Animorphs? Uh, 20 minutes, 30 minutes ago, we already covered it, right? I that agree. Poem. Yeah. <laughs> Could be put to a score. <laughs> well, the year pool is a little old place. <laughs> 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 Whoa! <laughs> we 
got that here, pool, baby. <laughs> Heather Clark asks, which alien species from Animorphs is the coolest and why? Um, the worst is the ones from the Andalite Chronicles that are, have like organic wheels, right? <laughs> That's the dumb. Wheelers, no. <laughs> um, the wheelers. The wheelers. Those are the. Um, this starts with an M. I want to say, they're they're uh, Visitor Three's pets. Those are the coolest ones. No, those are the worst. Visitor Three has pets. Yeah, they're these. They're Visitor Three cares about called? something that's alive. Really, <laughs> Visor Three. <laughs> so, what's the coolest, the coolest alien? Is it, is it the Andalites? I'd say so. Oh. I mean, that's such a basic answer, but I feel like they're designed to be the coolest in the book. They're really cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm. I'm a fan of Hork Bajir. Yeah, Hork yeah. Bajir, cool. Mm. Yeah. I mean, it ain't the Jeds. It ain't the Venber. Jeds. The Ged? soft G. Okay, yeah, they can... <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, the Howlers. Howlers are pretty cool, but the Howlers are almost like too like written to be a toy i mean that's yeah the they're like of them yeah. x-men villains or something the chi know? are too perfect yeah I mean, you could never oh, that's well oh yeah, uh, yes they're thank you cool. thank you yeah pretty cool yeah oh my god he knows yeah oh my god <laughs> mez logan asks do you <laughs> did you guys also have arguments on the proper pronunciation of <laughs> visor prior to live action coming up <laughs> yes, yes. Did. question thank you <laughs> mm-hmm. um emily had Emily Hadorn asks, I'm so curious if anyone in the gang saw I saw the TV glow. Oh. If so, I want to know your thoughts on this pastiche 90s nostalgia and the Pete and Pete cameo. I thought it was fantastic. Pete and Pete cameo. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's a blink oh. and you miss it kind of thing. Where is it streaming to the best of your knowledge? It's on everything right now. It was only in theaters for like a week or so. Oh, okay. Again, did anyone on the, the big orange couch? <laughs> <laughs> you are the big orange couch. Yeah, I... I <laughs> Nick. <laughs> On the did big orange couch. Seen it, right? No, I haven't I, seen I, it. I, I saw it, yeah, in a theater, yeah. Yeah, did, I mean, for the folks at home, you enjoyed it? Yeah, definitely. Um, it's um, it's not like horror horror, you know. Uh, it's it's horror themed, um, and it's a bit like you know, it's moody. Um, is so it, if I, I may, Max? Is yeah. it like that World's Fair movie that came out like two? Same, same person, same, same person. Really? It's better. I've seen both. Okay, okay it's much I was better. It's better. Very it's a more good. complete film. Yes. Very good. Yeah, yeah. very much. I, so. I would left that one disappointed. I didn't. I didn't hate it. it. Takes a lot for me to hate a movie. Yeah, but, this is a, a better th- version. Cool. <laughs> this is more existential. There is some. I wouldn't say graphic stuff, but like surface, like immediate, ooh, spooky stuff. Yeah, two mm. or three times. But um, it is the kind of movie you have to ruminate on just a little bit. I think it's super modern. I'm, I feel like it's a very um, uncompromised modern horror movie. Mm. Um, I don't think people over a certain age will appreciate it. I, 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 it's, it's not. It's weird to die on this hill, but it is specifically about late. 90s television yeah i walked out of it with my friend nora and uh and we're like oh that was like buffy and that was like so weird and like we had like this whole list of things that it like had the same vibe as it makes it seem so like um narrow to talk about it in such a way but it is we could talk about this for hours other people have for sure but it is about pre-internet finding identity in these burgeoning television shows that didn't exist 15 years prior, 10 years prior, things like Buffy, I guess kind of like the Animorph show to a lesser degree, maybe Dawson's Creek or what have you. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, I definitely go back to the, I, I, I'm sure there've been other films that have gotten into this, but looking back in the media that you were like uh, gestating your maturity through is uh, mm. a really course, cool way yeah. to do extensional identity horror. So yes, mm. great movie. Um, highly recommend checking it out. Uh, it's weird. Like a lot of these questions absolutely play into things we've already talked yeah. about. <laughs> yeah, we got great fans. We got great uh, patrons. Yeah. Um, Ian T. McFarland, uh, a friend of the show, asks, I regret to inform you that you're about to pull a Tobias and get stuck permanently in a morph. <laughs> what animals do you choose to get stuck as? I thought I was talking about how we've uh, been doing the podcast too long. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> what animal do you want to be stuck as? Ooh, good question. A flying one? No. Oh, I thought you said a fly. No, a flying one, perhaps. A fly would suck. A fly would be terrible. <laughs> hmm. I'd go with the sea turtle. Uh, they live a pretty long life. They live in cool places. Um, Humans spend more time and money to save them than our own poor. Yeah. Like, we love... <laughs> uh, we'll do anything for a sea turtle. <laughs> Once you're an adult, nothing's probably going to eat you. And if yeah. you have human intelligence, you're not going to, like... Eat like uh, you know a plastic bag, and because you think it's yeah. a jellyfish, and die. So, mm. Mm. yeah. 
Yeah. And you can be in, you know, land and sea. And, you know, you get the best of both. Mm-hmm. Neil? Ooh, uh, a dog? A dog would be good. Julie? I was going to say maybe a dog or a cat, but it really depends on the situation. You have to guarantee that also it's a good, like, family situation. Yeah, you You're don't want to be a jellical cat out on the street. No, no Grizabellas. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, if I can guarantee a happy home life, then, yeah, a dog or a cat would be great. They seem really happy. Mm. Ryan? Well, I would really miss human and in- meaningful human interaction. Uh, I'm going for a strategy here. I want to be something that nothing else eats. You got to be the top of the food chain. As humans, we enjoy that all the time. Most of the food chain ain't the top. Uh, and something that humans don't kill. Hence, sea turtle, pretty great. Um, I want to have federal uh, regulatory protection, the bald eagle. Now, we're going to get some gross, we're going to get some Tobias stuff, we're going to have to eat things we don't want to eat, we're going to have to kill things we don't want to kill, but they can't touch you. They can't touch you. Yeah. Ooh, they don't about, sound as cool. What about no. Bigfoot? Can I be a Bigfoot? Can I be? Yeah, change my answer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if Andalites are real, Bigfeet can be real. Yeah, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, they're very well protected. And they have thumbs. They do have thumbs, and they might be uh, able to teleport. You could, like, steal a Game Boy and, like, bring it to the woods, too. <laughs> <laughs> All the other Bigfoot in the tribe are just like, oh, look at that. Like, <laughs> You're like the Prometheus of Big Feet. Yeah. <laughs> big we're, Feet, plural. Like we're all dead within a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, my, I, I would pick uh, uh, something from the ocean, maybe a shark or something. Mm-hmm. I'd want to find like a creature from the sea uh, that had good eyesight because um, I, I, I'm a little afraid of the deep depths of the ocean. They unnerve me in a way. And I think it'd be cool to be forced into experiencing them and seeing things that no human being has ever seen or may ever get to see. Uh, we still don't really know what's at the bottom of the ocean. Be cool to see down there. See down. Yeah. Uh, how about a blue whale? Blue whale. A Nothing blue eats whale, them. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. They have to come back up though. I don't know how deep you can go as a. That's blue a good whale. point. What about feet? an octopus? Octopi. Yeah. Yeah. Squid. They're super small. Squid. Yeah. That, that's what you I. You wouldn't thinking. be a dummy. And you have eight legs. Uh, do, do they ever turn into an octopus in the books? Oh, yeah. They turn, there's a squid book. Cool. Yeah. They turn into fleas, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, they turn into everything under the sun. Mm-hmm. Last question is from Michael. It's a big one, but we should maybe, maybe just get a few minutes on this. Michael said, I think you have said previously that you would like to do an Animorphs film adaptation, sort of. We were asked once in a, uh, in a, uh, in a, in a commercial environment, in a place of employment by people who are attempting to license IP for possible movie adaptations, uh, we were asked in a meeting room, hey, kids, what should we make into a movie or TV show? We used to run Paramount. How can we keep making money? Um, that was the extent of that. And we we, we kind of came back a few days later. This IP license. Supposedly classic. They, they looked into it. They, looked, they did yeah, look yeah. into it. Yeah, we said Animorphs. Animorphs is the one that no one's talking about. Um, Michael asks, what film style would you use? Would you use practical effects, animated? Basically, how viol- what approach would we have? Would you use CG? What would the Andalites look like? How do you envision Animorphs working? Um, and Brygog asked a sub-question, what actors would you choose to put in there? Mm. So this this could go a long time, but broadly speaking, do we all think it should be a TV show or a movie? TV show. TV show. TV show. Yep. TV it's show. Epi- the books are episodic. Mm-hmm. There's plenty of source material to work with. Yeah. It was never set up to be... The first book could be a movie. Yeah. Most books can't be. You're not going to have 54 Or movies. a really good pilot of a TV show, right? You yeah. can have yeah. specials between Megamorphs. I'll turn up... Like, you can do... Visitor 3's Christmas. <laughs> 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 you know, kind of, Megamorphs kind of suck, though. I'm a lukewarm. Fa- I have uh, fond memories, and, and I will choose <laughs> to never reread them. Never uh, reread. I, I feel like you could get a good trilogy of movies out of it if you weren't precious about the beat by beat storyline. If you really reworked it for that format, I think the, you the went general, Hunger Games on it. Yeah, the general concept I think could work uh, if you just mm. condensed it down to a uh, you know. Julie, I'm sure you've ruminated on this. I'm sure you've heard a hundred takes. Mm-hmm. Like, I would love a TV yeah. series. So I cut oh, you off, sorry. Julie. But yeah. in short, the Andalite Chronicles is a theatrical release. Yes. that would be that would kick mm-hmm. ass. That'd be a good like finale, frankly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I see a lot of people are saying, oh, it should only be animated, and like it would. Yeah, that, that's yeah. cool. But I don't totally agree. Like, I think that with a proper budget, <laughs> um, a live action would be cool. Like, I. I don't think that, I don't know, it's like CGI can go either way. It can look really bad or it could be decent. But practical effects are definitely 
um, the grosser the better, right? Like, I, I completely agree. Yeah. And and there's there's a lot of really visceral description, visceral, 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 visceral <laughs> descriptions of morphing in the in every single book, and like you know the bones uh, popping out of the flesh and screaming, you know, <laughs> you know, and and um, there's got to be a little bit of that. It's like they if it was uh, if it was like turn around three times and, <laughs> and then I'm a bear. Yeah, you know. He's just Wonder Woman spinning. Yeah, yeah. You know. Wow, Cassie, that was incredible. <laughs> <laughs> With like sparkles. Just the mask. Yeah. You know. Have, 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 have you all seen uh, Looper? Bruce yeah, Willis yeah, time yeah. travel yep. movie. A long time ago. Um, there, there's a scene in that movie. It's the best part of the movie where mm-hmm. someone is retroactively tortured by the mob. Oh, yeah. The young. It's the best part. It gave me a nightmare. Yeah. But, um, that, That's that, body. There's horror. a scene where someone's climbing a fence. Uh, they're like a 50 year old gentleman, let's say, but the 20 year old version of themselves is being like having their fingers cut off in the past. And the way the movie shows that there isn't a lot there. There's not a lot of like showy like CGI fingers melting off. It's done through editing mm-hmm. yeah it's um, like you look away and then you look back and it's like it's like yeah. a nightmare yeah right? yeah i i think you could do some stuff there's like any director could come in if it was a tv show and figure out i think their way to do it i don't think you should have a strict bible on the way it's shown just go for what the scene calls for if it's like a fun scene if it's like we're gonna turn into birds like have some levity to it if you're turning into an ant because you have to sneak into a compound where you might get burned alive and no one will ever hear from you again yeah play up the horror of it mm-hmm. Um, I, so we're all, I think we're all fans, proponents of live action. No, I, 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 I could think, I think you're right. It's not the 90s anymore. Yeah. CGI is better. There are shows on television right now with terrible CGI. And there are shows straight to Netflix like The Witcher with movie grade CGI. Yeah. With, a, with a budget, the secret is money. That you you could do the Animorphs right with enough money. I'd like to see an animated version. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, not anime. I could see a Western... St- an anime could work fine. A lot of anim- animes are more likely to have younger protagonists. But, no, I'd like to see an animated version. And just, you can go hog wild and like do body horror right. Mm. Sure. Did you, did you check out those graphic novel adaptations? Not yet. Th- got, th- they look they look awesome. I've got the first one. I mean, like that... I, I don't know what it is, but those books kind of cemented that I don't want an animated... Oh, really? Mm. Okay. Yeah, I, it, uh, I don't think they're particularly bad looking or anything. It just hit me like, I, I kind of don't want a take on this. I want verisimilitude. Well, well, I think one of the things that Animorphs does well, and, and Julie touched upon this, is it's like, this this is real. This is relatable. We're going to make this as believable as we possibly can. And I feel like that's something that's best done through live action. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But at the same time... You know, you also are like, well, it'd be cool to see an animated Hork Bajir and all this crazy space totally, stuff. Totally. Yeah. yeah. So it's kind of like, eh, which one do you really want to lead yeah. into? All more? right. So, <laughs> not counting, uh, forget about the kids because we don't know any actors under a certain age. But as like the aliens and like <clears> the the <throat> Vizier three or whatever, like who would you cast as the I, voice? I mean, it's gonna be if it's Hollywood right now and they're putting like a hundred million or more into it, mm-hmm. it's gonna be like Doug Jones and Benedict Cumberbatch, <laughs> right? Like. It's it's Ooh, voice actors. You. Voice actors yeah. are the big thing. Um, Doug Jones' axe, you think? Cumberbatch's Visitor Three as an adult axe, as El, El Fangor maybe. It's, mm. Okay, who's the voice of Visitor Three? That's like the big one, mm. right? Like who's like who's the big bad? Who's a, it, who's a voice you really don't want to hear in your head, but once you hear it, you know they're. They're running the show. Oh, the uh, the guy from The Witch. Yeah, that's exactly what. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah and, that's uh, a good one. Green Knight. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That'd be a damn good one. Yeah. Nathan Lane. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, that's Vizzer Three right there. <laughs> can we make can we, from the Witch guys? Because he dies in the fir- yeah, he dies in the first part. He hands over his incredibly important power, Elf- Prince Alfangor, because you can Prince is now a thing you earn, like being Queen Amidala. Mm-hmm. Fuck it. Uh, Liam Neeson. Yes, yes. Uh, Liam Neeson's perfect. Yeah, yeah. Liam Neeson's perfect. <laughs> Listen, I teach you I, how to morph. Per- <laughs> Liam Neeson's a perfect. You can act. morph. <laughs> yes, you can morph now. <laughs> um, if if uh, if uh, time is no object, um, it might seem silly, but I think David Bowie would have been a good Elfangor voice. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Right? yeah, yeah. I think he would have given it his all. His all. I think he would have. You kind of want an actor that can get. Joe Sixpack to get like it's a cool alien movie, mm. and I think Bowie would have had that. I don't know if there's like a 
I don't know. I, I can't think of the last time there was a big, I mean, there's been plenty of science fiction films because of comic book adaptations. But when I think like alien ass aliens, I don't think like Michael Shannon, I don't think Chris Hemsworth, I guess he's an alien in those movies. <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, I don't even think Jude Law. Um, but like, I do struggle to think of who, it is more of like a 90s thing. It is more of like a Jeff Goldblum in 96. Even like, you think of like the Twister era of movies, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And it's a little easier to picture, like we got like Bill Pullman to play Principal Chapman, Vice Principal Chapman. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. Hey, all right. Thinking out, uh, thinking about the awkward, I think a Tobias would be good as Timothy. I think Timothy Chalamet could pull off Tobias. Yeah. That kind of nervous energy, but you, you know, sensitive. But there's a lot going on here, and you get to, you, there's, you pull off layers. I think the younger Skarsgård brother, who played Pennywise in It, would be a really awkward uh, axe. I think he could land axe. Sure. Uh, Lupita Nyong'o could be Cassie, not just because she's a black woman, and I don't know. Uh, uh, actually, the actress who plays Sister Sage could probably sound younger than she is. Because, again, I'm thinking about young adult actors because I don't know any teenagers, and they're teenagers. Yeah. I mean, we're thinking about these actors as if they were, like, 14. Age of yeah. Yeah. Yes. Liam, Liam Neeson is, is, like, probably the best I've heard in this quick discussion. Mm -hmm. It'd be funny if you took, like, someone wildly against type and got, like, um, anyone here watch The Bear? Not yet. Really? No one here watches no. The Bear? It, I've right, only so, heard good things. Uh, then the, the joke wouldn't land, but I was going <laughs> to say, you take Richie from that show and make him play Visitor 3, and that would be pretty funny. He's a townie. That's the joke. <laughs> How about Clancy Brown? I mean, Clancy Brown, I mean, uh, that's it's almost he's almost too perfect. Like yeah. he's, he's, he, he's the perfect Lex Luthor. Mr. Yeah. Krabs is too ubiquitous. <laughs> it's like putting Keith David in. It's like, yeah, you know, uh, yeah. another voice. It's sort of an, of course, <laughs> Kurt yeah. Russell as El Fangor. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Pascal's got a hell of a voice for Marco, but are we now just getting to stereotypes? Because I don't want to go there. <laughs> you went there. I know, yeah. <laughs> well, we're running out of time because we have to go get oh, more and cop costumes. <laughs> and uh, Jake is Shoot still up, played. Boys. Jake is still played by the actor who portrayed him in Ash Ice As Iceman. Yeah. yeah. Oh no, no. Better yet, we don't hire him. We hire his twin brother because yeah, he'll Eric. work for less. <laughs> yes, they were. They uh, were both in Smallville. Um, Sean, the uh, the A tier Ashmore was a villain of the week in the first season of Smallville, and then like six seasons later, they wrote in Jimmy Olsen and they brought in Aaron Ashmore to play him as a series regular. And Clark Kent just never acknowledges like, <laughs> "Hey, I fought a guy that looked exactly like you <laughs> two times. <laughs> Let's hang out." <laughs> no, that'd be kind of funny though. They just bring him back. He, you can find a. I'm sure you've seen this that cute interview with Sean Ashmore. Talking about doing Animorphs. Have you seen this? I think this? so. He's like up on talking about it. He seems to have a really good relationship yeah. with the material still. Like, I mean, I don't, I don't remember. Like, it's it's it. cute. Like he talk, I, There's like a YouTube interview. It's it's a fun. Mm -hmm. Like he he has he has good memories and he talks a bit about like the days they would go up on green screen and just shoot the intro of the show where the characters all have to like walk up on an X and go and keep going. <laughs> That's a funny thing to hear an actor recall. Like, ah, oh, yes, Animorphs. I remember the day we shot the tapes. <laughs> oh, you know, all right, final note on casting. I take back this, I think the Scars Guard could pull it off. I know this is Danny. It's a different Stephen King thing. While he could definitely do it, I want, not even trying to sound like a teenager because he's a goddamn alien, Axe will be portrayed, Prince Axe eventually will be portrayed by Kyle McLaughlin <laughs> as just <laughs> having a vague understanding of how humans speak. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to go, uh, I don't know why, I thought you were going to go David Duchovny. W what about. Brian, you need to watch the. Uh, uh, the, the Hidden. Uh, the Hidden. Yeah, Sorry, that's great. Yeah. The Hidden's great. What yeah, about you'd like the Hidden. Alan sure. Tudyk. Right? Is that his name? Help me out. What is he? He's in Resident Alien, which he plays like. Tucker and Oh, Alien. yes. Okay. Yeah, he he's he's English in real life, correct? No, no, but he has no. a very good British accent. Oh, cool. Very he, believable might, one. he might be a good Visser 3. Oh, all right. I know who you're talking about. He was on Firefly, right? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. I know. Yeah. All right. We're on the same page. Thank you. Yeah. We're running out of time. Uh, like Tobias. There's a joke there. I didn't <laughs> land it. I think I made that joke earlier. Screw it. We're all non-listeners. Well, this will be released at some point in the future. Thank you for watching our ruminations on Animorphs. Julie, you wanted us to not just ramble. Did we succeed? <laughs> <laughs> I tried so hard. 
We, we got an hour and 43 minutes on my yeah. clock here. So it That's is kind good. of how we quaint. get to turn back into humans. How quaint is it that two hours is basically our limit? One well. hour and 43 of your minutes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Um, I would love to talk about Animorphs again. Who knows if we'll get to do it. Julie, thank you so much for joining us for this. Thank you. Uh, we're now and thank you, Max. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess I'm a regular <laughs> now. <laughs> Julie, Julie traveled further to be here. Yes. Yeah, she took a bug fighter to get here. I forgot about bug fighter. Oh, we got to stop. We got to stop. <laughs> All right, Kevin, play us out. All right. Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in 18 minutes, our time.